Good day and welcome to the sermon for this, the 13th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. <clears throat> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Epistle and Gospel lessons for today have a great deal to say to us about the faith, and there's a great deal I could preach uh, about them. Uh, just briefly about the Epistle. In the Epistle, it begins our consideration of the contrast from St. Paul's Epistle to the Galatians and the contrast between the Spirit and the flesh. He says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the desire of the flesh, <clears throat> for the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit is against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Though the works of the flesh are manifest, and he goes on to a long list of unpleasant things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, idolatry, witchcraft, emulations, wrath, strife, etc. And then he speaks about the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no son, there is no law. Now, the thing that we have to be very clear about in this particular epistle is that St. Paul is contrasting the flesh, being led by the Holy Spirit, the, being contrasted with being led by the Holy Spirit. So it's flesh versus spirit. And it's not simply a matter of choosing, well, I'm going to do the good things and I'm not going to do the bad things. That's not uh, what he's saying. He's saying that the fruit of the Spirit that is the result of following the guidance of the Holy Spirit is these positive things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. But the other side is the way of the flesh. And these things, if we are honest, come more easily and naturally to us. Adultery, fornication, idolatry, witchcraft, murders, drunkenness, all those things come, you might say, naturally to human beings. And he says that there's this contrast between the two, but he also says, and this is key, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So you've got spirit, you've got the flesh, but you can't simply, St. Paul says, choose, oh, I'm going to be a good boy or a good girl, and I'm going to choose the good things and avoid all these other things, because you cannot do the things that you would. And so it isn't simply a matter of you know, discrete choices or individual choices at moments of time. It's a matter of our overall disposition and our overall intent and our overall goal. If we are intent and intentional in following the promptings of the Spirit, then as a result, as a collateral effect, we will then be participating in love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, faith, meekness, and temperance. But if we don't intentionally, constantly incline in that direction, desire to follow the prompting of the Spirit, the things that <clears throat> we don't really want to be doing, nonetheless, are the things that come naturally and the things that we'll fall into. And that's a long list of the things of the flesh. So it's very important that it isn't simply a matter of discrete choices. It's a matter of our overall intentions, our overall orientation and intentionality of how we lead our life and for whom we lead our lives. And here Paul is urging us to follow the Spirit. Enough said on that for today. The next thing is, of course, uh, from St. Luke, the Gospel, and it is the extraordinary uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, which, of course, people think they know inside out, and perhaps some folks do. Uh, one fellow came up to our Lord, and he said, uh, What do I got to do to inherit eternal life? And our Lord shot back and said, Well, how do you read your Bible? Uh, and he said, well, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And our Lord said, that's the right answer. Just go and do it. But the smart fellow who originally asked the question is not satisfied. And he says to Jesus, well, just who is my neighbor? Wanting, obviously, some sort of restriction on who his neighbor might be. In the Old Testament, of course, it's pretty clear that for most of the Old Testament, your neighbor was a fellow Israelite, and everybody else was other. Those Hittites, those Philistines, those Amorites, those Syrians, etc., they were other. They were not neighbor. They were not part of the covenant people that were your neighbor and you had to love. 
And so this man is looking at a limitation on neighbor. And then our Lord tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was assumed he was up to Jerusalem to worship. He was going back down, coming down from the holy city, and he fell among thieves, which stripped him and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead on the side of the road. And as it would happen, there came two religious fellows along, and by chance there came a certain priest that way, a priest like perhaps John the Baptist's father, Zachariah, been up and did his thing for a month in rotation in the temple, and he, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side didn't even go have a curious look. And likewise, a Levite, a choir member, another clergyman who was up to Jerusalem doing his thing in the temple, perhaps for a month at a time, when he was at the place, he came and he looked at him, gave him a better look, you know, this is an accident scene, gave him a better look, and then he passed by on the other side. And then finally, a certain Samaritan, a foreigner, with whom Jews had no dealings, he journeyed, and he came where he was, and he saw him, and he had compassion on him. Not curiosity, but compassion. And he went to him and he bound up the wounds of the fall half dead in the side of the road, poured in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, a donkey perhaps, and brought him to an inn and took care of him himself that night. And on the morning when he departed, he took out two pence, two coin, and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. And then the end of the parable, our Lord asked the fellow who originated this questioning, which of these three you think now was neighbor to the fellow who fell among the thieves? And the obvious answer is, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so at one level, the parable of the Good Samaritan seems to be an urging on us to behave like the Good Samaritan did to be kind to the fellow half-dead on the side of the road. But of course that doesn't fully jive with human nature and with the epistle which I just partially explained. The epistle says, and I quote St. Paul again, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Oh, we can make up our mind in church, I'm going to behave just like that good Samaritan. But then we leave the doors of the church and we run into the real world and all its complications. And we end up behaving much more like the priest and the Levite. They may consider, perhaps, when you come across the fellow half-dead on the side of her, well, maybe this is an ambush. Maybe the fellow's faking it. Maybe those robbers are going to jump out and get me. Some others may think about, well, what are the insurance liability implications of all this? There are all sorts of reasons, rationalizations, and justifications that people use, not entirely off the mark, that are used not to behave like the Good Samaritan. And so we miss the point, I suggest, if we think it's just an urging us to behave like the Good Samaritan. I would suggest that there is a deeper and more profound meaning here than usually meets the eye or is usually explained. And it is this, that really the parable of the Good Samaritan is our Lord telling a parable about his own particular behavior. That is to say, who is the ultimate Good Samaritan? It is our Lord Jesus himself. He came to this world and behaved like the Good Samaritan, as opposed to the religious people, the priests and the Levites, the one who's half dead on the side of the road represents human beings, humanity, us in our human condition. We don't do so well. We find ourselves in desperate need from time to time. We are lonely. We are alienated. We are alone. We find ourselves, perhaps in reality, but perhaps feeling uh, spiritually like we're half dead on the side of the road. And while others may find us a curiosity, while others may consider us worthy of a glance, there is one and one only who actually takes the risk, goes out of his way, and secures our help. And it is our Lord Jesus who comes under the guise of the Good Samaritan to our aid, to our assistance. He is the one who came down from heaven. He is the one who actually followed the promptings of the Spirit, actually took the risk, actually did what was necessary. And the two pence left to the innkeeper, the innkeeper perhaps representing the church, the two pence perhaps representing the two great sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, which are meant to sustain us on the journey until we finally recover and maintain our trip all the way to our final destination. And notice too, the traveling Good Samaritan says, until I come again. 
and I will repay you all. So it suggests that as the church has understood this parable down through the centuries, it is ultimately a parable in reference to our Lord's behavior, and particularly when it's combined with the, today's epistle, contrasting the flesh and the spirit, and St. Paul's statement that you cannot do the things that we would, it's a strong argument in favor of this being the number one, the primary, the first interpretation, the first level of interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan. With that, I'll leave it. With that, I'll leave it to your consideration. And I pray that we may all indeed take the lessons of this extraordinary scriptures, these extraordinary scriptures to heart. And let us pray indeed to the great Good Samaritan, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ for his grace, for his aid, for his guidance. Thanks be to God. Amen.